Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome on the Learn Grasshopper webinar series, Learn Grasshopper Live. Uh, welcome, uh, we are on the LinkedIn and we are on the uh, YouTube. Uh, we are starting shortly, so give a thumb up, just write a comment if you can uh, hear us and if you can see us. Uh, so there's already 100 people live. So if someone can uh, just write a comment, I know that we have some uh, seconds of lag. So we will wait for the first comment to see if you can hear us uh, well. So Maher, hello, hello Maher, uh, you are here. Just let us know if you can hear me well. So shortly I will introduce. Okay, we have more people are coming. We have also people from uh, LinkedIn, Darius, we have Osama, we have Tom. Uh, good to hear loud and clear. That's good to know. And as always, if you can just write a comment where you are coming from, maybe you are coming from some universities, uh, just write uh, from which university maybe you are um, calling to us or where you're sitting so we will start shortly in just a couple of seconds hello there's many familiar faces carlos conrad eddie hi everyone and uh, so i'm today with sfera and martin uh, i'm uh, located uh, today in poland so i'm calling you from poland from gdynia uh, Sfere, where are you located? I'm located in Bergen, in Norway. Okay, so we have Bergen, so we have West Coast, West Coast, <laughs> and <laughs> Martin. And Martin, where are you based now? I, I, uh, I am calling from uh, Switzerland, so <laughs> uh, Middle Europe, I would say. <laughs> oh, I, I'm surprised that because you are based in Trondheim, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, normally. Are you, in, are you on vacation or or? Hard to say vacation, but uh, I'm visiting my family. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good to hear that you found out a good connection there and microphone and you're with us. Okay, we have people from Sydney, Brazil, Morocco, uh, university. Yeah, we have some people from the university. Greeting from the police uh, university, Tirana, Albania. We have people from University of Cantab Cantabria. Uh, people from Oslo, some people from Norway, California. Oh, California. It's 5 a.m. So someone was really motivated to <laughs> uh, stand up so early and uh, come uh, to us. Okay, so we are live, as I said. Uh, I will appreciate if you can leave a thumb up and you can uh, share this event with the rest of your community. Uh, on LinkedIn, if you can uh, react on this uh, event and on YouTube, of course, if you click thumb up, of course, it will help us a lot. Uh, hi, Pavel. We are starting uh, shortly, so let me see. I will check if everything is okay. Uh, guys, do you have water? Are you prepared for webinar? Yeah, I even have coffee, yeah. so I will stay awake yeah. for at least an hour. <laughs> uh, especially people, uh, especially people from California, needs to coffee. Needs needs coffee as well. Uh, we have from India, even people from the campus there. Okay, uh, so let's start. Uh, we have lots of uh, content to show you today. Uh, so today's uh, webinar, uh, it's planned for one and a half hour. We'll see. It depends on your questions. So we have content with about 60 minutes that we would like to share it and the conversation between me, Sfera, and Martin. Uh, then it will be Q&A session, uh, about half an hour. And again, it depends how many questions you will have to these uh, two gentlemen. Uh, uh, some questions. I already saw some question if this record if this video is recorded and it will be available afterwards. Uh, yes, it's recorded and it will be available on the platform. Uh, but uh, you need to register. If you haven't registered and you are seeing this on LinkedIn, for example, so you need to go to learngrasshopper.com slash webinar. Uh, so you will get a link to this webinar. Uh, uh, right after uh, live after this session and uh, with the summarizing. Uh, 
Uh, I really encourage you uh, to write some question uh, on the chat. Uh, we will try to show all of your questions. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're watching that on LinkedIn or YouTube. So just write your questions uh, here. Uh, we have also people from university in uh, Sweden, uh, Gediminas. Maybe you know Gediminas, Marcin and Svera. Can say I do. Sorry, Gediminas. <laughs> yeah. I actually, I actually was about to ask you because the Gediminas is making a great stuff uh, on uh, his YouTube channel, and he is working in the Lund University, and mm. maybe some of the collaboration between you because yeah, you are working in the kind of same areas, uh, maybe Gediminas more in the. Uh, rendering and uh, AR stuff, but yeah, I will I will for sure contact both of you uh, after this uh, webinar. Okay, so what topic we will cover in this session? First, we will of course talk a little bit about increasing inter interest in programming among structure engineers. Everything started with architects, but now there is more and more engineers using uh, computational design. Uh, afterwards, uh, Sfere will share some successful master thesis examples and experience from parametric CAMs. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to that one. And Martin will close with some statistics and tell us about a little bit game-based learning programming in education. In my opinion, this is the way to go and this is how the future universities will look like. But I will, I will look closely how this development uh, will go. Uh, okay, so this is the this is the agenda for this was the agenda for today. Uh, so I would like to introduce uh, Martin Uczkowski and Sfere uh, Hokosan. They are both uh, working at NTNU. Martin as an associate professor uh, and uh, Sfere as a PhD candidate. Uh, so first, a um, little bit maybe about me, for those who don't know me yet. Uh, I'm Krzysztof Wojsław. My name is Krzysztof Wojsław. Uh, people just call me Chris. Uh, I'm uh, having a platform, educational platform about Grasshopper. It's called learngrasshopper.com, uh, where I try to share uh, my knowledge about using Grasshopper in practice in AEC industry. Uh, in addition, I'm also academic lecturer. Uh, I'm also uh, an academic lecturer at Ziggurat, Global Institute of Technology, uh, and at the NU, NTNU as a guest lecturer. Actually, after invitation from Martin, now I'm having some guest lectures. But uh, this is enough about uh, me. Uh, let's start with Martin. And Martin is also senior structure engineer at MultiConsult, whereas uh, besides his work as a professor and having lots of students, master students, lots of PhD students, he's also doing some uh, really hardcore structure analysis. And Martin is really well known as a C-sharp wizard. And actually, my experience shows that every every uh, new graduate that is coming to Sveco, where I'm working, actually know Martin. So actually, everyone was after a supervisor of Martin. So all the most talented engineer engineers are after supervision of Martin. Uh, do you have something to add? Maybe you you, you would like to introduce yourself. <laughs> I would say that it's it was more than uh, nice that you that you what you said. Uh, I think I, have, I will present some projects so people will uh, probably catch uh, what I'm doing during this session. Yeah, uh, I yeah, I would like to want to say that uh, Martin is uh, also fight in the as a jiu jitsu Brazilian jiu jitsu is uh, as a, his hobby. So uh, I will not mess with Martin. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, about Sfere. Uh, Sfere is a PhD candidate at NTNU. Uh, he is working as well, uh, in addition, uh, in Covey as a senior structure engineer and working uh, in NTNU as a Python and Grasshopper academic instructor. And as far as I, I, know, I know, that Sfere is trying to use every, every minute of his uh, life to, uh, <laughs> to to use the computational uh, computational design. Even in his hobby, she tried to design 
uh, bookshelves or uh, just just to use CNC machines to do the work for him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did. We were, we're expecting a child in a month, and uh, I just got an, a message that I have to stop it. I, I cannot make like a CNC furniture for children. I have to actually take care of them like physically as well. So it will be interesting to see how it goes. Yeah, I think that your next project it will be like a bed for a child made from the CNC machine. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so today uh, we'll talk mostly about using Grasshopper, Python, and C Sharp. Uh, uh, that students actually from the university are using them, and Martin and Sfera are trying to introduce uh, students uh, so early uh, as early as possible. Uh, can you tell uh, when students are introducing Grasshopper first? Uh, or is it Grasshopper first introduced before Python and C Sharp? No, uh, first we are introducing um, Python uh, course. And to be honest, we are already doing it at NTNU on the second year of education. And we are doing it for the last five years. Uh, that uh, I think five or even six years uh, from now on, it's obligatory to take Python courses. It's one semester of basic Python programming. When students, uh, where students are uh, learning uh, principles of coding, uh, but unfortunately, then they are having three years without coding, and they are coming back to us on the fifth year, uh, and we are teaching them first. Uh, uh, let's go with the visual programming or algorithm guided design uh, with Dynamo and Grasshopper, and uh, because it's also um, it's also switched into uh, two phases. One is something which we have uh, in at NTNU, which is called project assignment, just before delivering the master thesis, uh, and we have also a course for the whole fifth year uh, students. It's uh, TKT for 198. Um, if you are interested in you, you can uh, search for TKT for 198 uh, on the Google, and you will find the syllabus of it. But uh, in general, then we are teaching them again uh, Python, but already inside Dynamo. Uh, and uh, then most of the uh, programming uh, development of the students, it's based on the um, Structural engineering cases. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, uh, then most of them are continuing uh, with uh, C sharp on the project assignment uh, and on the master thesis. And then we are doing them uh, individually workshops on the C sharp and uh, how you can create your plugins for the Grasshopper. Okay, so you're starting with C Sharp on the almost the last semester. So first is Python and Grasshopper mostly, and mm -hmm. then C Sharp at the end where they are writing master thesis or before that. Yeah, it's also a little bit before that because this is this project assignment, which is but it, it's all, not for all of the students at the year. It's only those one which will be probably writing the master thesis with us. So it's approximately, uh, let's say. 20 to um, to uh, to uh, sorry are you um, <laughs> presenting the, uh, the yeah the screen? I can yeah I can I can show I can show your screen right now yeah because just to let you know and you it's not a super big university we are quite good when it comes to the Scandinavia to especially to Norway as a technical university uh, our structural department uh, department, because me and Svera are from the structural engineering department, and you have to remember about that. We have from 100 to 140 students uh, each year, which are writing master thesis at our department. Uh, from those, um, 15 to 20 are writing it with our CSDG design group, which is a conceptual structural design group. Um, and uh, then they are doing it with uh, me or with uh, Sfera. We have also cooperation with architectural department at NTNU. Uh, we are cooperating with uh, people there also. And from this uh, 15 to 20 people which are doing the master thesis, we are introducing on the fifth year. Um, so one year before delivering the master thesis as C-sharp uh, courses, because most of them will finish with the plugins for the Grasshopper. 
Yeah, I see. And how many people are in the conceptual structure design group? You, you mentioned you and Sfera. How many people yeah. more are actually there? Uh, right now, we are on the process that we uh, just two PhDs from architecture has uh, finished, and uh, one more is coming in October. And we have also three professors. So it's approximately, and there's uh, also two people at architectural department. So we are about five, six people, but uh, it's that mostly me and Sfera and also Bunji Izumi from architectural department are um, responsible for educating uh, students. Yeah, because everything started with architects, right? Uh, some years ago with computational design or it was before with structure engineers as well, or it was just come from architects or it was always done, but structure engineers wasn't like, weren't showing off the results as architects showing this crazy facades and organic shapes. <laughs> what, what, is, what is the true about that? Uh, I, th I think the truth is that generally uh, on the very beginning, uh, structural engineers, so we, we were ahead then we lose it a little bit to the to the architects, and then in the 90s, I think in 2000, the biggest development of especially visual programming and algorithm aided design, it's on the level of the um, uh, on the stage of the architects. But uh, I think last uh, five six years, uh, I, I think it's come back to the structural engineering, and the reason why it is like this, uh, I mostly see in the uh, in the fact that uh, for some years in the 90s, there was a huge development of the softwares, which were generally uh, not open to change. And uh, we just have to take what it is. So you are paying for something and you can design only what uh, you can do, you can design. And fortunately for the last years with the softwares like Grasshopper, or even Dynamo, uh, Autodesk also open their repositories, their libraries of the objects. It's much easier to create even your own finite element uh, algorithms uh, to analyze the structures. Uh, not saying about the building information modeling uh, stuff, like EFC is uh, open much more, I think, than it was before. There is uh, a lot of open projects uh, in which you can generally uh, use on the normal basis. Uh, so, so I think it's coming back uh, uh, to us, but yeah, in, in very often when I, especially 10 years ago, I think, when you think about the Grasshopper or Dynamo, or if, if there was a Dynamo at that time, uh, then, then you were mostly thinking about uh, fancy facades of the buildings, something yeah. which was really dynamically uh, dynamic from the architectural perspective. So, yeah. Yeah, but uh, maybe for Sfera, because I introduced you as a Python and Grasshopper instructor. So when was your first uh, lectures about Grasshopper and Python for structure engineering? Maybe you were already as a student. Uh, student. Or as yeah, a as a student. student. Yes, a student, as a student. Yeah, as a, as a student. I think like the first introduction is like Martian Martin said, like the first year. But then you're like, you, you, you wanted to be a structural engineer and you never really thought about this parametric design to be honest, and then you, you introduce the Python and these making pancake recipes or making like uh, a chess game. Mm -hmm. And you have like three or four other courses at the same site time, which the things that you're actually interested in is happening. And then you kind of don't prioritizing that course. You're just getting through it, you forget about it. And then it was in my fourth year when I had this um, Dynamo and I uh, started to play around a little bit with Dynamo. And I did it also when I had a summer internship in Kuvi. I was lucky enough to be introduced to it and play around with it by some senior engineer there. And that's what really triggered my interest. Because I think like Martian said, the first time you hear about it, especially parametric design, you think about it as this uh, architectural thing of making these parametric geometries with curvy facades and, and like very lofty structures. But when you see, it, and when you start to see it as an engineer, you can see like all the things you can automate, all the things you can simplify, just to have more time to do actual engineering and more complex engineering, and hopefully together with the architects. Uh, and I think that's where the course of Martian, this TKT forty one ninety eight, is very good because you you get an introduction and you learn to program in an environment which you're already familiar and you have an interest. So it's so much easier to learn something 
when you know like the surroundings and you're interested mm -hmm. in the surroundings and you're very interested in the application and you can see kind of the benefits straight away of me learning this. Yeah. And in the meantime, we got al also already a question, why Dynamo? And I know why you are laughing. <laughs> Well, the industry is using Revit, so like if we want to prepare mm. them for something, they can take us straight away. It's uh, mm. it is much easier to use it, and of course uh, they have these uh, academic uh, like student licenses for free, so everybody can download it. There is no issue. I mean, you can download Rhino for thirty days trial, but it's then you know you have to do some tricking, and I'm not sure if we can recommend as like an, as an official course to do that tricking. Yeah. Yeah, 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 but, but it's fair. We, we have a license for uh, Rhino. We have a few <laughs> in the project assignments. We have like 60 licenses for Rhino um, yeah. in the course, but it's not enough for these big courses, right? Yeah, but also when I decide uh, on the beginning that we will be doing stuff in Dynamo working with uh, Reddit, and I didn't want to start from the big C to introducing to the Grasshopper and uh, Rhino and people will go to their consulting companies and see that everybody are doing any, anyway stuff only in Revit, uh, maybe something in Dynamo. Uh, so, so I want to be closer to, to, to Revit. At the, this time, of course, we have Rhino inside and stuff like that, but this is last two, three years. A um, couple of years ago, there was nothing which was, or there was something, but it was very hard coded to connect uh, Revit with uh, mm -hmm. Grasshopper. So, uh, but do you see the but do you see the chance in the future to just keep Dynamo part, or are you just thinking that it will be still in our industry and uh, the big deal? It's hard to predict because it's you know mm -hmm. it's developing constantly, and I have to say, like personally as well, I, 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 we started out with Dynamo, and I see that with all the students as well. They have this this TKT course with Dynamo, and then move on to Grasshopper, and everybody prefers Grasshopper, but. Uh, I have to say, like, I just tried a new Dynamo 24, uh, like mm. the Revit 24, and, and it's getting better. It's like, it's not as shady as it was, uh, like, five years ago. So, uh, it, it, I mean, it's hard to predict, really. Uh, mm. In the meantime, I also get a question. Is there any of your courses that you're making at NTNU that can be done remotely? Or you need to be uh, mm. all the courses that you need to attend as a student of NTNU? Mm, yeah, I think uh, most are for just NTNU students, uh, unfortunately. But uh, then uh, we are sending some stuff also on our YouTube channel, which we have CSDG NTNU. So, yeah. so uh, especially when it comes to the master thesis, uh, we are publishing. Also, we have some, but uh, unfortunately, some of them are outdated because. Uh, yeah, uh, we didn't update them uh, from year to year because we have a lot of uh, also different research uh, responsibilities. Uh, but from time to time, we try to send something there. So um, unfortunately, for have the newest one, uh, you you have to be a student at NTNU. Yeah, and yeah, let's talk a little bit about parametric camps because this is the this is the thing that I actually. Uh, known you from YouTube first because of the parametric camps. If you can, Sfera, tell what is the idea about parametric camp? So is NTNU organizing parametric camp like additionally to that all the lectures that you are having with uh, computational design uh, or is it just for NTNU University or is also outside for industry? Initially, it was, I think it started five, five years ago or something, and it was this collaboration between architects and engineers uh, in, in the research group, uh, CSDG. We want to give this, it's like a, a voluntarily course, so the student doesn't get, they don't, they don't get any credits for it. So from the engineering side, we do this like the last week in January, just before they start with the master's thesis. So it's kind of like uh, as a kickstart to introduce them to visual programming, a little bit of Python and Grasshopper, if they want that. And we also try to bring in as much architects as possible, because also for us, this uh, collaboration between architects and engineers is very important. And you don't have that almost at all in the four, first four or five years. So giving them a chance to meet each other, sit together in a room, like a one week super intensive course, working almost 12 hours, just programming, designing, 
and, and getting together and create stuff and also build it at the end so that you mm -hmm. get that whole kind of from the idea to the actual structure within a week. Uh, okay, that's so a... you're you're building kind of like the wooden structure or pavilions or yeah, usually timber. So it's often like limited to where we're allowed to put it and the time available and also some cost. We don't have that much money, so it's like often plywood that we we stick to. Yeah, and it's done in the like the summertime or outside or it, because you said that it's one week. It's... Yeah, in January. So in, in Norway, in Trondheim, it's uh, normally super cold. So uh, we, we try to stay inside. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will uh, share your screen. So maybe you can share yeah. some of the some of the picture from this uh, parametric camps. Yeah, sure. So as, as I said, it's like for both architects and engineers. And we, we try to have this 50-50 uh, distribution between architects and engineers to be able to divide them in groups and design things together. But we see that the architects are not as flexible as the engineers when it comes to this uh, first week uh, in January where they don't have anything on their schedule. So they mostly have to combine it with some other courses that are mandatory for them. So we normally maybe have like 30% architects at the moment, but we're trying to, to make it even more even. So this one is from 2019. So here we build this kind of grid shell structure with this uh, connections and everything was designed again within one week with the architects and engineers. And some of them, they have maybe taken this TQT course, maybe they have half a year with Dynamo, but also I guess 50% of them have never touched like Rhino or uh, Grasshopper before. So there's really starting from zero to hero in a week. And I think it's really funny and we have a lot of fun. And it's also this, uh, this great icebreaker because a lot of them we will work with uh, for the next three, four months uh, as supervisors. It's also a nice way to get to know students in a way you normally won't do in this lecturing uh, setting where you're just standing in front of an auditorium and they are sitting behind. And also, I'm not sure how that is in other countries, but I know at least you don't ask many questions when you're in an auditorium. So even though you stop and ask, is there any questions? Most likely you will not get an answer. But here, when we can walk around with them, we can, people are a little bit, a little bit more loose, they're asking. We can answer, we can sit down, we can discuss. It's a, it's a really nice uh, teaching and learning environment, I think. But it's uh, like lots of students from abroad as well, right? Or is it just yeah, mostly it's, Norwegian uh, people? From architecture, we, we get some exchange students from abroad, which is really nice because they have completely different perspectives and come in. And I think they find it very fun. And I think you have the statistics margin, but I think people are coming uh, to our university almost just to get this course, right? Yeah, that's true. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, we we see that generally we have uh, constantly year to year people from the same universities because people the students starts to give the tip to the next year that uh, hey you can go to Trondheim and take this course and it's fun. So so uh, I I think uh, uh, it's nice to hear that uh, we have uh, repeating uh, people or people from uh, the same place. I have to say also here a, a small uh, comment to, to what uh, Svera said about the um, division between architects and uh, structural engineers. I think recently we see the much bigger popularity of those two in the structural engineering department and in architectural department, at least at NTNU. I think it's a little bit worse last years uh, to find uh, students to work with us. Uh, I think. Mm. Uh, it's uh, probably because of the style of teaching, uh, but uh, that's maybe a longer discussion how uh, architects are educated to to uh, to work with the um, algorithm-minded design and generally with the digital tools. Uh, but in the last at least uh, four years, I would say, uh, it's hard to get to this 50-50 percentage uh, of be between architecture and structural engineers. Because also not so many architects sign up uh, for the uh, for the camp, so so um, we generally like we, we we try to make it for 25, 28 people, and we normally have like 60 people uh, which wants to attend it, the parametric camp, uh, and 40 of them are from structural engineering department. Mm -hmm. So, so there, there is a big difference between uh, also. Um, Let's call it um, popularity uh, of of uh, design tools and programming uh, 
uh, in two uh, faculties at our university. And afterwards, I assume that most of people that are after parametric camps, they are starting to write master thesis, right? Like mm -hmm. maybe not 100%, but actually uh, I, I assume that it's a good motivation to con continue if you if you just started doing cool things. So write not to write a master thesis about that. Yeah, we have quite high percentage, I, I think close to 100%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so, maybe, so maybe Sperry can show some of the examples because maybe uh, we can just jump into into practical uh, application of Python and C Sharp and Grasshopper. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, uh, yeah, just uh, I'll just go quickly through some examples, and and these are again the work mostly of students that you can start from zero, and then they have this half year of uh, dwelling into technical issues. So this is one project, I think it's three three years ago now, where they wanted to look at how we can create this formwork more efficiently for these very uh, parametric structures. So in the end, it was two groups that collaborated and they wanted to create this formwork based on the stress lines. So they, and they learned how to learn like C-sharp because the plugins for the formwork they did in C-sharp from scratch. And they used Caramba to do some analysis of these different types of, types of slabs. And then based on the stress lines, they created this kind of inverse geometry to, to create the, uh, the, the formwork. And we used the CNC mill again to carve out um, the pattern, which we could cast into. And we used this um, fiber reinforced concrete uh, to cast it. And we cast some parametric legs. And we could also reuse the formwork for most parts. We could just take it out and then clamp it together again and cast more legs because uh, we had some accidents uh, with some composite glue, uh, which we didn't read instructions on. So when we're lifting this, all the legs fell out and we had to to, to re recast them <laughs> in order to, right. for the students to finish. But uh, And th this table is like uh, one by two meters almost. So it's, it's kind of a, a lot of work for uh, 20 weeks for these students. And uh, yeah. most of it couldn't be done, I think, without programming, because as soon as they establish this workflow, if they want kind of a different uh, stress line or a different shape uh, on your slab, the stress lines will change according to the flow mm -hmm. forces. And then you can just redo or like you recalculate and then you get the formwork ready and you just present it to the CNC email and it will carve it out for you. So it's, it's really impressive how far they get. Is the table are you still using? Is it standing at the university somewhere, or is it showcasing yeah. on some conferences? Or it, it was standing there, but then uh, I think the uh, the lack of space last year they had to get rid of it after two years. So now uh, I think it's a concrete graveyard or a landfill or something. Yeah, but it's really looking good. Uh, we will get some we'll get some comments that, that that's neat. And really, you get a use case of using uh, computational design. And uh, we have some more fabrication. So uh, we had at the architectural uh, workshop, we have this uh, robotic arm. I think it, it's been there for probably seven, eight years. And it's very old. And nobody knew how to use it. We just saw it when we were using the CNC mill. And like, oh, can we get this robot robotic arm to work? And nobody knew. But we had these two students, Anne and Hedvig. And they got to it. And like again, in, in 20 weeks using programming, mostly Grasshopper, these girls, and uh, HAL Robotics as a plugin for managing the, the robotic or translating movements and these lines, because you have to, with the robotic arms, you have to kind of create the lines that will follow. And then you need the HAL Robotic plugin to transfer that into this G code that tells the robot how to move. Mm -hmm. And they did all of this again in 20 weeks. A lot of prototyping, a lot of learning and failing because there's no instruction to this arm. It was kind of old, uh, an old and like really awkward assembly to get into positions with it. But they ended up making a couple of prototypes for this uh, grid, this king post timber grid, which is made traditionally without any uh, metal fasteners. Mm -hmm. So they were able to do that, and they also kind of integrated into that workflow. Uh, the volumetric analysis in ANSYS, which is also like a huge step, taking that geometry from uh, Rhino, inputting it into ANSYS or any other finite element solver and meshing it and applying loads. So this is what we've been working also in uh, later years. I don't know if you have any questions to that first one. Yeah, yeah, about this robotic arm. 
Uh, yeah. If you're gonna, do you have it at the university? This robotic arm? Yeah, uh, it's in the architectural workshop actually. So we have to do are, nice. Are, to are architects yeah. using it or not? No, there's sort of <laughs> dust going out there. I think they they were using it as a bike stand uh, when we got there. <laughs> the oh really? Workshop, the workshop, which is parking the bike against it. Oh, what a, what a waste! What a, what, what a, what a waste of good. <laughs> yeah. So, but but now we're trying to use it, and uh, and this is from this year. Um, where, where we're, um, uh, we took it one step further uh, with Sulvai and Askil, as you can see hanging here, and we built like a one to two model of this Norwegian uh, Grindehus, it's called. So again, Grasshopper, Hal Robotics, created the geometry, and they also did this uh, Karamba analysis using like just Eurocode verification of connections just to see that you have approximately right the um, dimensions on your on your sections, also, also these are massively overdimensioned, but that's kind of the style of the buildings from uh, traditionally. And um, they built this, and actually it was used as uh, at a party as a beer pong house. So we had a beer pong table in here, uh, a lot of architects, a lot of engineers, uh, and then um, uh, people were discussing a lot because you have these architects are uh, with like traditional timber crafts have been discussing about using robotic tools how can we kind of solve this um is it still like traditional crafts when you use a robot or is it not is it valid is it not there's a lot of mm -hmm. good discussions around that which is really interesting because in this traditional norwegian like houses like this one you're not using any screws any joints or yeah, like that's you're that's using joints but not screws right yeah that's the tra traditional like uh, timber um, uh, timber assembly process. So we wanted to kind of recapture that uh, with this design for disassembly approach. Uh, we should have time. We, in this picture, we didn't have time. It was the last day before submission but to, to just drill the whole holes with these uh, panels to put them in there in timber so that you can disassemble it. And the whole thing, when you have the part, you can dismantle it in like one hour or two hours with two people. You can take it down and up again in a new place. Mm -hmm. so uh, it was some. It's also some question. Do you guys work with ETAPS API to plug in for structure design? No, uh, we haven't no. used that. Uh, we, we mostly use in this conceptual phase, it's a uh, Karamba 3D, which is like this plugin for um, uh, Grasshopper, where we have everything. This is a finite element analysis software for lines and uh, uh, shell structures. Uh, sometimes we use, uh, like, we can use Fem Design. Um, Sophistic, but I guess Etaps is just another one of these. If you never tried that, not me at least. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have some comments for this kind of the results. There is no need of parametric nor robot. Seriously, there is some comments. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's true. And we got that the, we have these guys at the workshop, uh, really skilled uh, carpenters. Like they, they, they could do this in a day, uh, even before the, the students had made a grasshopper script. But I don't think that's the point of it. It's kind of uh, again, they're starting from nothing, and, and they want to see how far they can get. And they're learning a lot in this journey. And of course, if you have this set up, and like, okay, here we build a traditional timber house, but like, you can you can use the same approach for different structures, right? Mm -hmm. so I think like this very example is like, if you can do it with uh, with the tools, uh, like hand tools, why should you try to use it with parametric design? It's more about the approach and scalability of it. If you're going to yeah. make hundreds of these, uh, then good luck by hand. Yeah, the same with the tables. It, it was also a question about that. So yeah, of course, someone can manually do the same table, and maybe it will more, use more time, or maybe the same the same time amount of time at the first time. But if you are going to present like do hundreds of them or make more advanced analysis, then you are screwed. <laughs> yeah, and if you uh, introduce curves and anything, then it starts to get complicated. Yeah. Yeah, let's go to the next one because we have some question about the Grasshopper libraries and uh, and yeah, you showed because here is the, it was a question: Are there any pre-existing Python or Grasshopper libraries for frameworks tailored for structure engineering needs? And I think it looks like you have an answer here right now. Yeah, and uh, of course, Karamba, as I mentioned uh, previously, which is also like uh, commercial licenses compared to like different software, very cheap, uh, and you can do a lot with them. And uh, I think they're really getting uh, quite advanced now compared to a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is also something we look at in our research, trying to make this finite element uh, algorithm. So I said, like with the first girls doing this um, 
simple King Post Trust uh, robotic arm tools and having to export the geometry to ANSYS or Abacus to do the analysis, we try to do that inside uh, Rhino as well. And these students took it one step further using this open source uh, Phoenix software, which is, um, you can access it, access it, you can use it in Python, and it's uh, working with um, partial differ differential equations to solve these finite element problems. And they implemented that in Rhino. I can just start a video, maybe that's better. And you can see this is the architectural model uh, from a project and they can work directly on it on the objects that the architects made and they can do their uh, computational design on the connection so normally as engineers we would have like a global model with beams uh, from from lines but then uh, if we want to look at the details like connection and the steel and the steel plate they want to do that directly in the architectural model so we have your global model for um you can do that also in caramba right uh, parametrically and then with the details where you need this volumetric uh, elements today we would have to go into ANSYS so they try to solve this by taking those BRAP objects from Rhino and applying like meshing and everything uh, inside Rhino so here, here's the result of that and you mm -hmm. can see they can scale the displacements they can show displacement stresses in the holes and then you can suddenly uh, get quite advanced in Rhino and Grasshopper uh, and Caramba, I, I see already question. Do you use Caramba for timber connection analysis and custom design for timber? Um, for timber, there is no um, there is no component in um, Caramba right now uh, solving that because they have like some Eurocode checks for uh, for steel and um, but there is this robot uh, plugin. It's called um, Beaver. Beaver, yeah, uh, yeah. which is kind of, kind of you, you use Caramba to get your global forces. And then uh, you input them into Beaver, and they do your kind of Eurocode capacity checks for you. So you get your dimensioning based on the Eurocode uh, for timber. So I think that's the easiest way to get started with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and here you just show the Phoenix, which is the library, uh, and it's yeah. open source, right? It is it's open, open source. Yeah. There's a lot of example in Jupyter notebooks if you want to get started. It's it's really cool. And. Um, yeah, should I continue? Do we have time? Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. Let's go. Uh, and we also have, like, because I think a big issue for a lot of structural engineers is that you have these IFC models with, uh, and then you have your structural engineering model. So these girls, Elise and Trina, they looked at how you can take from the IFC model, and again using Python and also the plugin Geometry Gym for Grasshopper, but the uh, IFC Open Shell in Python, which is open source to kind of extract the relevant elements for the structural analysis into um, a line and create a line model from that, that you can analyze also almost directly in Grasshopper, for instance, using Karamba. And also, how can we use, like when we're thinking design for reuse and design for disassembly, when we're thinking of reuse today, we often go onto site and we try to map or categorize all the existing elements in a building and how we can use them. But if we're thinking about how we can build uh, or, or rebuild in 30, 40 years, how do we be, uh, model our BIM models today? So what kind of information do we put into them so that we can assume that, say, in 30 years, we just have the BIM model, model of that existing building, and we can extract the relevant elements from it, and we can reuse it uh, in a new building. So they try to look at this for workflow where you have this kind of uh, demand building you want to build, and you have an IFC model, which you can disassemble, so to say, and then you pick relevant elements from that. And you do kind of you do that, and you also get your structural verification because, after all, we're structural engineers, so this part of the right is what interests uh, interests us most. But of course, everything every workflow is uh, coming together. So, and in the industry, you're working with a lot of different disciplines. So, hmm. and trying to find those workflows are very very interesting. Yeah, but what I see right now, so yeah, it, the idea of reusing materials is great, but. First of all, you need to have IFC models, but actually the buildings that we are demo demolishing right now, they are like 40, 50 years old and they are not having IFC IFC files. So this may be kind of in the future uh, yeah. projects or, or you maybe have already experience with some IFC. Yeah, from... I think it's like a future approach because I don't think we should like, even though today we have to uh, go into uh, go on site and do this categorizing and uh, make everything into tables, 
we shouldn't think that we should have to do that in 30 years is kind of having two thoughts in the head at the same time. So what do we do with existing buildings and how do we design future buildings and make it easy to disassemble them and reuse the material? So I think it's hmm. two different approaches to the same issue. And this is your project. This is your topic of your must. Uh, so sorry, from PhD thesis, right? Uh, kind of uh, a rel related, but not the main topic. I'm more into the engineering part, but that's the beauty of master students. Uh, they're very interested. They have a lot of time. They're very good, and they learn programming super fast. So mm -hmm. when I have different kind of ideas, I can discuss it with them, and they come up with these interesting topics that we can kind of develop on the side together. Uh, so this is one example of that. Uh, we have some comment. Uh, which structural analysis tool is mostly used with Grasshopper for concrete and steel structures from your experience? Maybe Martin, what is your experience? Um, uh, to be honest, uh, if, it depends on which stage. On the concept stage, I'm mostly using just Caramba. But for the concrete, it's more problematic because when we are uh, talking about the reinforcement, then we have to switch uh, software. Uh, I am using a lot of fan design and the plugin from Grasshopper to fan design. I generally stop modeling anything in fan design. I'm mostly doing stuff inside the Grasshopper Rhino and then sending it through the plugin to fan design. So we are also developing at Multi Consult where I am working the, the plugin, which is uh, generally creating from uh, the conceptual drawings uh, automatically the fan design model so it's also based on the c sharp uh, but uh, uh, i was using also sophistic at uh, one time i think the grasshopper plugin for the sophistic it's uh, also pretty good but of course it's a uh, bridge oriented uh, so so um, uh, when it comes to the classic steel and concrete structures i would say that the fan design plugin is the best which we have right now in the market yeah, I, I made an article on Beam Corner. If you write mm. type PEM in Grasshopper, the ultimate analysis software list, you will should find it. So I made the list. Actually, there is a 14 uh, connections to Grasshopper. Mm. So it's always, you cannot choose the best one. It's always, <laughs> yeah. uh, so, some, some of the tools are having some issue. And then another question, uh, is it possible to go open source with all these things? like you are showing right now, like the software packages to add up uh, cost a lot. Uh, can yeah, you imagine yeah. the workflow that with software that costs nothing? Um, That's so presently. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you can take it, Martian, if you want. Yeah, because uh, the, the thing is that what we are presenting till now, what Sphere is showing, uh, it's a master uh, thesis level. So uh, let's say that uh, we are giving a task for the students and uh, first of all, we are always publishing our work on the GitHub. So everything what you see probably have some repository on the GitHub. Uh, also, every NTA new thesis, uh, it's open source. So um, if you even will Google the name and the surname of the author of this thesis and you will add NTA new master thesis, you will find it, uh, the whole thesis. And probably in the thesis, you will find the link to the GitHub. Uh, because a lot of those um, tools which uh, Sfera was presenting uh, are finishing at the end of the master thesis as a standalone plugin for the Grasshopper. Um, so so you, you, you can combine them and you can uh, try to use it, but you have to remember uh, that this is master thesis work. Uh, so so uh, it has some limitation. We always have to assume some simplification and some range of the flexibility. So I, I would be skeptic if we can use the master thesis work as a, as a full uh, programs uh, like um, done by some company. But I think they are also not so far away from it. So if you want to develop, you can just copy the repository and start to work on it. Hmm. Yeah, Sfera, do you have something to add? Uh, maybe you know some uh, uh, open source uh, I think, software. I think I think I think in theory you can. I mean, everything is code, so you can you can program. But at the, at the end of the day, it's about how much time. Especially if you're a big company, it's, it's very hard if everybody is making their own plugins and can try to link it together. And you have to do like the version updates. And I think at some level, 
especially like foreseeable future, there will always be need for uh, expensive, some, somewhat expensive design tools. I think like this, like Autodesk, for instance, like with the Revit, if you want every Autodesk product, I think just crazy expensive at the moment. Mm. But I, I think there's potential there. And you, and you see more and more people developing open source uh, plugins and, uh, and being able to kind of have the, the basis package of like one design software like Revit or Tecla or Archicad or whatever. And then being able to kind of pick and choose uh, different open source of the software to solve very specific tool uh, problems or even program them yourself if you can, like using Dynamo and using Grasshopper. Uh, I think we will see more and more of that uh, to save the cost. Like yeah. there's these plugins for Revit, uh, for instance, if you have like just a wall in in, uh, in Revit and you might want to make it into like a timber wall, like an interior timber wall with the posts and the bottom and top. And, and you can buy a license for that uh, for I don't know how many hundred euros and or you can make it yourself because it's it's not really that complicated if you know some basic code. So I think these kind of plugins and open source code you can solve uh, and alleviate some costs. Yeah, yeah, sure. Let's move on to do you have any other master thesis or you should we go to Marcin? Yeah, we, uh, we can. Yeah, this is the same, but here again yeah. about, about the open source. So this is a project uh, that we're currently working on. I think you will find uh, with the QR code, you will find this um, repository in GitHub. But these students are helping us. We are developing these different matching algorithms that allow users to say that you have a material bank and you have some new structure that you want to build and find the best possible um, solution to that. And I think uh, I can just share. Um, and everything is in Python, everything is open source, but then you have the problem again that uh, you have to know Python in order to use it. So these students, Las Magnus and um, Sigurd, they helped us uh, develop uh, both like some of the code and they also made this user interface just to show uh, how it can look like if you have some files with the data, typically CSV or Excel, because everybody's using Excel still uh, at some level. Mm -hmm. and, and then you just input everything that's necessary uh some information about like your material uh, if you want to include transportation how much it should cost like how much should the material cost you how much do you want to price emission if emission cheap uh, or it costs nothing at all it might be cheaper to buy new material but if you add some price to the emissions then suddenly uh, re reusing material also can become more economically uh, and you can also choose different algorithms that you want and then everything is calculated for you uh, and, and you get some reports. Um, and this is also a tool, I think, that can help people. But you want, it's open source, so it's developed so that everybody can take it. They can pick whatever part of the code uh, they want from it, or they can just copy it straight away uh, and continue reusing it. And I think there there's a growing community for developing these kind of open source uh, environments. And actually, it was a question. Uh, do you know any communities and forums where students can seek help or share their experience with DC tools? Uh, and... I think for Grasshopper, it's definitely definitely yeah. the Grasshopper forum. Like, uh, no question. Uh, do you know something I know else? My students as well, because uh, yeah. we don't always have time for them uh, to answer every question. But... Uh, I always advise them to make a user on the Grasshopper forum and uh, they, they find themselves getting a lot of help. So it's a really nice community. Hmm. Great. Uh, let's uh, let's move on to the gamification, game-based learning. Uh, if you, Martin, can show your experience. Uh, I think this is the, the future. This is the next topic of this uh, webinar that mm. you can just show your experience how you build an application and game for for teaching people uh what yeah. it was uh what was the mechanical engineering no uh, the structural engineering uh, department yeah. in, in mm. which we are working uh yeah because the, the the one thing maybe i will just make some comment to what Sfera was uh, or uh, i would like to add something to what Sfera was explaining Generally, in the last uh, seven years, when we are running CSDG, uh, we make approximately 100, over 100 master tests. Um, I think 60% of them are just uh, a lot of them, more than half. Uh, people were developing their own uh, finite element method uh, in, in, in C Sharp or in Python, the solvers. And it is because um, 
it is super easy for the structural engineer right now to do such stuff. Previously, when the softwares were working as the standalone black boxes and you didn't have the uh, possibility to use the, uh, the visual inter, uh, um, interface and also the, you have to create your own geometry, it was very difficult to create only the finite element method uh, solver. But right now we are pushing a lot of people to do their own, like their own caramba, their own abacus, their own answers. And it is possible to finish quite nice uh, project within uh, 20 weeks uh, of the... Uh, of, so, you, um, so, so you can say that your students can build Abacus model and Caramba model in 20 weeks. It's not possible, uh, Martin. Yeah, <laughs> no. it's not, uh, but uh, for example, this uh, one of the projects which we have at uh, uh, yeah, it was uh, um, four years ago. Or five years ago, we investigate a lot of virtual reality and uh, what you can do with the virtual, re uh, virtual reality, how you can model inside the virtual reality, and how you can observe the, um, how you can process with the post processing. Uh, and to be honest, those groups of students, because here is a presentation of two groups of students, uh, they develop their own finite element solver for the volumetric uh, objects. And then they push it to the VR that people could change uh, the geometry in VR and observe in real time the stresses, the displacement, and generally what's happening to the structure. Uh, so, uh, in fact, they built a very basic, let's call it a linear elastic finite element solver for the volumetric um, analysis in 20 weeks together inside with um, already the interface for the virtual reality. So, it's quite amazing how far people can go if they have a proper programming skills. Uh, it's um, something which I would say 10 years ago, it was impossible to do in 20 weeks because we didn't have the libraries, open libraries for the, for the geometry. And this was even blocking us. So right now, if you want to create a colored map of the stresses, it's not that you have to create your own algorithm to uh, uh, to uh, use the RGB colors and to somehow populate those colors on the surface. Right now, we are just using Rhino IPI. You use the mesh and you say color it from this to this. Uh, so, so you can focus on the finite element method uh, itself. Um, so, so that's one thing how we are thinking about the gamification of the design. But the second thing, what I would like to present. Uh, it's the game-based learning. So, so for the last uh, years, we uh, also were trying to create games in which people or students can cooperate with the with the um, with the either web application, either the grasshopper. And uh, for example, this what you see right now. It's this year uh, work of the students. Uh, it it is a game web game uh, for the mechanic one and mechanic two in which the the player have to go around and solve uh, different tasks uh, from the mechanic one and for this uh, he is getting the points and if he will finish in time he has some extra points but if he will not succeed in the time he has some kind of the punishment uh, so we, we we make this game to help um, second year students at mechanic uh, one and two to uh, to uh, proceed with the with the um, uh, knowledge. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't finish with the testing uh, it. So the tests will be will be this semester done on the students. <laughs> we will see how much faster it is to to learn those uh, uh, classic mechanic theory by game or by uh, normal lectures. But so um, it was the same the same exercises, right? Uh, like yeah, you done in the game, the same exercises, but it was presented in a different way. So, so uh, it doesn't really change. Uh, we didn't change the the the, the type of the um, uh, exercises. We just uh, changed the form of the exercise, how you present it. Uh, here you can see the different cases of the gamification, uh, but on the level of modeling, you already see the project uh, which Sfera was presented which is connecting uh, Phoenix X uh, to, to the Grasshopper. Alternatively, you can see on the top uh, left and right two projects which were uh, working with the 
sustainability. So, so the algorithm on the left top is uh, trying to match uh, the elements which are not um, which are not um, enough good from the from the set of the elements which are on the left side, uh, which uh, you can see here. It's trying to match it to, in real time to the structure which is changing the topology. On the right side, you see generally the shell uh, finite element uh, uh, method, with, so something which Caramba can do, but students do it, it from scratch, the finite element method in 20 weeks with three different types of the finite elements for the shell with their own meshing uh, tool. So, so uh, I think if you know programming, uh, it, it opens uh, a lot of doors which were closed for the from for, for the previous years. And also when it comes to the working with the model, which you can play around with the model and observe in real time how the stresses, how the forces inside are changing, it's completely different uh, education. Because uh, when you go, uh, I was also a teacher at Mechanic Free uh, for, for, for some years. Uh, and I know that students, if you will give them the frame, like the classic 2D frame, which we, we all know from education, and you will say that there is some load, like a point load on the top, and then we will, uh, we, we have some kind of the roof, uh, the angled beam, then how the stresses are changing in this beam, you can train on maybe five, six examples, uh, but you will not get, uh, you will not experience it enough to have the intuition. And by playing with it, uh, you have the intuition. Uh, you, you get very quickly the intuition what is happening with the, with the support condition, what is um, generally where are created the critical points of the structure. So uh, the students, I would say, gain a lot of experience. And generally, people gain a lot of experience in a very short amount of time uh, by playing with the models which can interactively show you the results. And I think that's why I am especially interested in the, in the game-based learning and the gamification, because you can just explore it more and you have much better experience in it. At the end, you are special. And I love the interface. It just remind me uh, the Pokemon on the consola. I don't know if you play that Pokemon. Uh, yeah, this one, Pokemon red, yellow, and blue. <laughs> Yeah, it's. Um, I, I have to say that this student was uh, very keen on doing it in this way. Uh, we are very open on the students' ideas, so we didn't block him uh, at this stage. I think it is quite interesting game. Um, so, so, but it still needs some development, definitely. But we will test it, and we hope to announce um, the results in some scientific uh, research. Yeah, it would be cool to see. Uh, I'm. Uh, I think that it can be uh, more uh, A's uh, in the exams. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I hope so. At least for the mechanic one and mechanic two. So, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, it was some question. Is this re webinar is recorded? Uh, yes, this webinar is recorded, and if you register your email on landgrasshopper slash webinars. Uh, you will get a recording uh, afterwards. Uh, do you want to uh, like to share one more project, Martin? Uh, I don't know, because the time is running and I'm thinking if uh, I can present some statistics from yeah. education yeah. of the students and by this, uh, because probably we, we, we slowly have to... Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, let's go to statistics and just share uh, the graph that you are having. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I have some statistics. Most of them, I have to say, in, in, on the beginning of it, we are doing research about educating uh, structural engineers. So a lot of those statistics are not yet published. And uh, I just uh, think uh, I would like not you to reference those statistics before they are published. So we have to treat it as uh, some kind of the confidential, or of course, in the sense that we make a friendly agreement. Uh, so, so uh, when it comes to the statistics, uh, we, as I was saying, having 150 students each, uh, the course which I am presenting, um, TKT for 109, when we are teaching students, are taken by more and more people. I will show statistics about that in uh, one slide. 
But first, I would like to go back to the purpose why we are teaching uh, people. And I have uh, some internal statistics when we make a survey and we have a feedback and we see that more and more people start to use uh, AAD. So let's call it a Grasshopper and Dynamo because I didn't uh, split into those two softwares when I was asking in the survey because I think they are super close to each other. Although we can argue about the productivity and efficiency of those softwares. But almost one third of the people which are working in the consulting companies in uh, big um, consulting companies in Norway are using uh, once a week uh, AAD. Uh, so either Grasshopper, either Dynamo. 25%, I think it's quite shocking, uh, at least it, it was for me, uh, declared that once a week are using programming, uh, Python, C Sharp, or uh, Visual Basic uh, to solve some kind of the issue. So I, I thought it would it's be a much. Lot. It's, a, it's a lot. It's a lot. I think it's a lot. Yeah. So, so but it's also showing how many people's, um, uh, how many people uh, is uh, really uh, aware of what they, and also how many of them can program. So, so it's quite uh, amazing. Uh, but when it comes to our course, uh, we always have uh, the, sur the survey on the beginning of the semester and, and the end of the semester. What you see right now. Uh, it's the survey about what kind of the softwares and what is your knowledge on the beginning of the course. So they are starting the course. And we see that generally uh, before they come to our course on the fifth year, TKT 4198, or, uh, it's, a, it's not exactly obligatory course, but it's open for everybody on the fifth year. Uh, then uh, if you will take a look on the, for example, BIM software like Revit Archicad, uh, then 25% of them still don't have idea what kind of the software it is mm. on the fifth year of education. And when oh, it really? comes to Dynamo and Grasshopper on the fifth year, almost 50% don't know what Dynamo, uh, Dynamo and Grasshopper is. So, so, so. <laughs> The first time when they meet those kind of the software, uh, it's our course on the fifth year. So um, it's, uh, I would say that uh, uh, I also make some question, like what does B, uh, BIM means, the shortcut, and you don't really want to know what people <laughs> were oh. guessing <laughs> what this shortcut means. So, so the, 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 my, the, 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 the nicest, or I think the, the, the best one was the, Bad idea, man. Boom <laughs> 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 short get the uh, explanation. But when it comes to the popular popularity of our course, we see that from uh, 2017 when we started the course, and it is growing. More and more students are taking our course. I think it's good because uh, I think it's preparing them better what uh, uh, what will be in their work. Uh, but also we bank statistics how many of them. Um, feel about the parametric model, uh, modeling skills, their modeling skill, uh, skills before and after. And when fifth, uh, five number, this is before the course, uh, we see that a lot of them doesn't really have idea what the parametric modeling is. And after uh, one semester, we see that generally they treat their skills or they, the, the, a lot of them uh, say, they have a medium or good skills in parametric modeling. Of course, this have to be somehow um, uh, somehow uh, graded. Uh, I always make the survey before the exam because I know that after the exam, a lot of them are angry at me and maybe. Those <laughs> <laughs> but before the exam, uh, they, they treat their skills quite well. Um, and when it comes to the importance of the parametric uh, uh, parametric modeling, I have to say that a lot of students after this course, because this is a survey and that those are the answers after this the, the semester, treat uh, quite good the, or they, they declare that there is a very high importance of parametric modeling and educating them in this direction. Um, the, um, I also ask some general question. What is the knowledge about the generally machine learning, AI, VR, parametric modeling? And on the blue, it's uh, that how many of them thinks that they, they at least once heard about it. And it's uh, the statistic uh, here. And the yellow is that they have no idea what it really is, all those uh, new technologies. So it's showing also that 
at NTNU, I can only say about our university, somehow we don't introduce information uh, about the new technologies. Uh, I don't know how it is in the other universities, but at least in our cases, our case, we have still a lot of to do to implement the knowledge about the new technologies uh, around the students. And uh, sorry if uh, two more statistics and uh, I'm ready to go. <laughs> uh, generally, students like my course. So I think, uh, and again, this is before the exam. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, that was the last one. So uh, I always give them the chance. I will decide when you will grade my exam and no. <laughs> so most of them is giving yes, but only few of them uh, specify that they don't like uh, the, the course. Uh, yeah, but, but I really, but I really like the statistics where where it comes to uh, if you think that grasshopper or computational gun can be useful programming in the future, and at yeah. the start it was like no, none of people, and then actually exploded, and more and more people been thinking about okay, this is actually which is going to happen in uh, in the future. Yeah. yeah. And I have to say that before the course, they don't even know what is it, or 50% don't know what is it. So uh, also, I have to say that uh, although NTNU and Norway is treated as very innovational uh, university and country when it comes to the BIM, we as uh, educators, as the university, will still have to, uh, I think, involve those information a little bit uh, quicker than the fifth year, because uh, then the quality of the master thesis and the education would go uh, up, I think. Yeah, uh, I have some question. Uh, can you people share the link for or the course? Yeah, we share it. So you can find that on the NTNU TKT4198. And actually, it was more a uh, question. So let's go to Q&A uh, session. Uh, it was one question that I would like to find. Uh, if let me see i will uh found it uh let me see uh, there is any uh, do you recommend any courses or suggestion to start learning c sharp code for grasshopper uh, so now we have a big announcement together with uh martin we are working uh, on the c sharp training that will be released really soon uh, if you would like to uh, sign up for waiting list so go to c sharp in a, a, a aec dot com so you can register you can download some exercises and actually find out uh, how to use c sharp in uh, grasshopper so i'm really looking through that so that is the answer for the question so for everyone really recommend to sign up for the list so the you will best get the best offer when the uh, training will be released and small announcement uh, at the end before Q and A session. Uh, let me see. I will move it a little bit. In two weeks, I'm going to have a, a next webinar on the Learn Grasshopper Live together with Caramba 3D. Martin, for sure you know Matthew uh, yeah. because you've been working with uh, with him. Uh, so uh, there's it was many comments about Caramba today. Uh, we talked about this software. Yeah, I think it, this current software is amazing. So Matthew is going to present several uh, projects with the Caramba. So it's really uh, already possible to register LangasHopper.com webinar Caramba. Okay, so let's go to some question. Yeah, there are lots of questions that we are having. So let's start maybe from the uh from the bottom what are the advantages and disadvantages of using grasshopper for parametric design compared to scripting languages like python so maybe use for yeah uh, that's a very good question uh, i think especially if you if you're a beginner i think that the, like what the grasshopper and dynamo gives us is it's it's so easy to get started it's much more intuitive you kind of see the flow like the like it's almost like it's almost like a flow chart right you have like specific components performing a function that you want to perform and then you link them together by lines so that kind of parametric thinking that you have to learn this flow chart uh, and you and you often sketch the flow chart before you start the programming even scripting like python you, you get that kind of out of the box with uh, these parametric languages but i think so, so as a beginner, and if you want to share with it, share it with others that don't understand any code, it's easier to start with Dynamo and Grasshopper. But as soon as you kind of do more advanced stuff and do bigger things, I think 
you want to look into scripting because it has a lot more so the flexibility and it's a lot neater. I mean, it's instead of like this huge spaghetti monster, you can have a small little component. So uh, yeah, it depends but, on your need. Yeah. yeah, but are we still like uh, about this transformation from visual programming into text-based programming? Uh, will you recommend just going straight to visual uh, studio or just like um, make this kind of step, intermediate step and go with the text-based programming in, in, into Grasshopper? What is your experience and with your students as well? I think for me and for the students. So what we do with the students is that we often start with vision programming. So like Dynamo in the course for everyone and then Grasshopper for the master students. And then you have these Python and C sharp scripts that you can open up and it's kind of out of the box. You don't have to download anything. You don't need to download Python. You don't need to download like an IDE, like a developer interface. So you just have the code, everything is ready and you can kind of start taking it step by step. So take one box, one component. So create a line for instance, and try to do the same thing with code. So it's kind of a very soft start in an environment you're familiar with. So that's normally how we do it with students. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, next question, any plugins have you done to convert our Grasshopper script to uh, CSI software like ETAPS and uh, SAP2000? Uh, if I, I remember correctly, I wrote it on the chat as well. You have Geometry Gym and you have Salamander plugin, so actually can help you to uh, bring geometry, export geometry, take your load. So yeah, you can use uh, these uh, connections. Uh, let me see. Mm, next question. Uh, uh, is it possible to solve the models done in Rhino using ETAPS or Stunt Pro for com commercial application where the majority of businesses are familiar with these programs and validate for analysis? Uh, I can still uh, answer for that. So yeah, so I think there is also Geometry Gym has this link. So actually you can help and make your geometry you can in grasshopper you can make uh, load combinations there and send it to the etaps or stat pro so it, it, i usually not recommend just to do everything in grasshopper but you use the software that you are using and you are most familiar in your environment but most of the automation can be done inside of grasshopper and maybe with some python or c sharp uh, links um well, let's say next question. Uh, is it the need that you master Rhino before learning Grasshopper? Maybe you, Martin, can answer that. Mm, I don't think so. Uh, I think you can work on Grasshopper with just a really basic knowledge of Rhino. And generally, this is what we are doing with our master students. We rather don't do a long courses for Rhino. Uh, we just treat it as a platform to preview geometry. Most of the... Uh, most of the stuff we are doing in Grasshopper. So, so, uh, but for for a, it, it's nice to have the knowledge of the Rhino on the other mm -hmm. side because if you want to change some something manually, some small, especially if you are asking me from uh, from perspective of a structural engineer, not a pro, um, professor, not educating, but just working with, uh, then I very often are doing algorithms which are um, using geometry pipeline and I am producing something in Rhino and then automatically it goes to the grasshopper. So I like this combination, but yeah. definitely you don't have to be a master in Rhino to, to learn grasshopper. So. Yeah, 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 definitely. Okay, maybe it's something more advanced stuff. Maybe you were waiting for this kind of question. Uh, now about uh, <laughs> machine learning and other recent developments in AI being incorporated in parametric design. It might be too early to tell, but I'm curious about uh, what is your uh, work? Have you been working in some machine learning projects, for example? Uh, Sfera, mm -hmm. I know that you've been working on something. Yeah, we did a little bit, but I think it's a very good question. I think if you ask me the same question next week, there is some new thing happening. So it's going so fast, but I think like these language models, uh, for me at least, it, it, it's already like, I think uh, if you compare it to Python and C Sharp and like these global languages, Grasshopper is not that big. So, and I know we went to the hackathon, Martin, where some people integrated uh, this uh, chat GPT functionality into Grasshopper so that you kind of, you, you tell it what to do and it writes some proposals. And I think what I use it 
most mostly for is uh, this GitHub cockpit function, which is kind of the same. But then, if you do your uh, programming in C sharp or Python for making plugins, then you kind of have a helper, so you don't have you save a lot of time on making like the for loops and the function uh, basics, and you can just customize it to your needs. So, so, so right now that's how I use it at least. But uh, I'm sure it's coming. Uh, but it's not my field uh, to develop those language models. Okay, uh, a standard question, which is coming in every single webinar. What is better, Revit and Dynama, Python or C Sharp? Uh, it's hard to answer in the just right. I think that nobody has this answer. Uh, if you, if you, uh, uh, Python and or C Sharp. Uh, <laughs> uh, of course, we have C Sharp uh, wizard uh, here, and we have Master of Python, so they can argue and talk about this topic. <laughs> and, and, and uh, we ha we actually have plans to talk about just make a several webinar just about Python and C sharp. Uh, so yeah, so th there is no uh, simple answer. So both are great in our industry, but let's uh, let's uh, stay with this talk and wait until until this next uh, webinar because this is a really huge topic and we need to find uh, really lots of examples. Uh, one of the last two last three questions, if you have more, just ask so we can answer. Uh, what workflow would, would work best for getting quantities for bridges in early design stages? Grasshopper makes sense, but we usually don't model the bridge in the early stage. Okay, so I will answer that. So maybe it's the best way to start modeling uh, bridges in early stage, right? <laughs> uh, so if you're not doing that, so maybe with Grasshopper you can do it. Uh, estimates. Uh, what do you recommend for structure comparison, caramba or sophistic in this case? Uh, if, you, if, you, if we are speaking about just early stage, so definitely caramba. You can uh, you can make analysis there, so you can really quick uh, calculate the quantities for steel, even for concrete. You can make analysis and make some cal easy calculations. So definitely in the early phase, start using Grasshopper. Um, uh, let me see here. Uh, I once used Grasshopper to convert G code to curve lines to get dimensions to infill inside a 3D printer part. But it also involved programming in Python and had to use ChatGPT. Any idea how to improve this? Um... Should I answer? <laughs> yeah, if you have, if you have an answer for that. So... <laughs> Yeah, first of all, the, the G-code, uh, it's um, well, when you're converting something to G-code, uh, I'm not sure if it's the, 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 the best way to do it, because uh, the G-code, uh, I don't know if many listeners of this podcast knows, but the G-code is the code which is um, taken to the CNC machine or even to the 3D printer. 3D printer, all of the machines are working on the G-codes. So then there is a question how we contact with this machine. And most of the machines are using G-code or uh, most of them. Uh, then the, the question is why you want to produce the, uh, the, 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 the very big question, which I would say here is that it really depends what you want to, what kind of the tool you are using, because it will be a little bit different approach when you want to just use it uh, to produce the g-code for the uh, for the 3d printer and different to the cnc machine but anyway like uh, i would be if i can make small comment i would not use just gpt <laughs> at this date <laughs> i think you have to uh, have to learn a little bit more uh, i was checking just gpt quite often recently and it makes still a lot of mistakes, especially when it comes to the structural engineering and things uh, uh, connected to the G-code that probably are also not so popular. So I would be at least uh, very, very... Uh, sensitive about this topic? About this topic. It's, it's a question like, opposite. does he want to, from G-code, does he want to go back to lines in Grasshopper to visualize things, right? Mm. Yeah, uh, it's so, right. so it's kind of you have the G code for your machine, and maybe you want to see how it looks. I don't know. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. Then I, then probably... I, would, I would use programming to be honest. Um, yeah. for, uh, for before Grasshopper. 
Uh, okay, uh, maybe more general question, uh, maybe Yisfer, uh, what kind of careers can people expect in the future after your training program that you have, like some real life examples apart from the academics? Oh, that's a very good question. I think that's uh, one of my biggest interests in doing this PhD as well, is like, what, what can we do with, uh, with programming uh, as structural engineers? And I think at the moment, especially in, in Norway, the industry I'm familiar with, uh, uh, I often see that, and I, and I try to keep in contact with some of our students, and I see that they come out and they're very good in programming, as we showed and we talked about, but I'm not sure if the industry knows what the students can do already. So, so, so many of them, unfortunately, go straight into this classic structural engineer role where they use these static models, uh, rather just modeling lines and doing finite element analysis from the from bottom up. But I think there's also those who are really driving for this. They get really good careers in uh, in industry already because they become a, kind of these gurus in, inside a company and they can have the freedom to kind of work with exactly what you want. And I think that especially like today, if you want to do development, right, instead of doing like working on a single project, you can work in a bigger company, you can, uh, you can lead this research group and you can develop tools for uh, structural design that everybody else in the, sort of, uh, in the company can use. Uh, so, so I think you can work both as a structural engineer, like on a individual level, just using Grasshopper or Python or C Sharp or whatever to kind of mm. uh, automate and, and be more effective, or you can go a little bit higher up and look at developing stages. So it's really up to you what you want, but I think definitely there's more doors open if you know programming. Yeah, and I think in Martin and Sfera is a good are good examples because mostly, uh, if they're working as a structure engineers, they are developing tools. Uh, in addition also to automate their tasks. So actually, this is the future of engineering. So this is the same like career, but with more fun, I will say. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's more fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, last two, we have still five minutes. So last two question. Have you guys used hops? A uh, question from Thomas Mena. Uh, and if so, do you know how to build a component library using hops and integrate Git for version control? Have you ever worked with that? I just tried it once, hops, so, so uh, for running like a Python script, because uh, if you, if we want to do C Python uh, without getting too technical, I guess I think he means. Uh, but uh, I, I ended up just think just because uh, it was a small project, so just running uh, the Python script from terminal through a C sharp script. So not not really the answer to the question, I think. So I haven't looked any more into it than that. Sorry, Thomas. But uh, as far as I know, the Rhino 8, which is coming probably this year, will include that, right? They will have C Python, as far as I've heard. Uh, you can download the VA work in progress version if you want to test it as well. Mm. And that's yeah, also, okay. uh, we, we talked down on Dynamo quite a bit, but uh, the latest version has C Python, so you can use NumPy in uh, Dynamo now, uh, which is also pretty amazing. Uh, it was one uh, comment about Python and Plaxis. Uh, it's useful for analysis for geotechnics, soil uh, structure uh, interaction. I know, Martin, that you work on one of the projects when you involved the plexus. What is was what was your experience uh, on that? Mm, yeah, it's generally, yeah, Python have for the last years open for, um, or uh, sorry, plexus has opened for the Python coding. So, so we can make uh, pre-processing in uh, a little bit with Python and also run the analysis from batch uh, with, with the plexus. We make a small project, or it's not so small, it was uh, seven stories office building uh, in Trondheim. And we automatically generate the plexus model from the grasshopper, right and grasshopper. Uh, I think it's um, when it comes to the soil structure interaction, uh, to be honest, I am not a geotechnician, so so I just prepared the model exactly like the geotechnicians want me to prepare, and he was satisfied. <laughs> but uh, so 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 I can only say like this: uh, uh, Python is definitely something. Uh, I think most of the softwares, like uh, like now, even um, uh, you know, or was from the beginning that the Python was one of the most popular uh, language when it comes to the working inside some softwares. Like uh, even in Rhino, you can make a script editor for the Python. You don't have to open Grasshopper to make the codes. Uh, so so um, 
it, it is useful. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And last question, actually, this one, this question we got from Pritz Eric from Consolis uh, Group, and mm -hmm. it was about GH Python script. It was the problem. Uh, I think that's fair. You've seen this question. Do you have answer for that? Have you tested? Uh, I think you're muted. Uh, Svere, I think you're muted. We cannot hear you. Or maybe oh, some yeah. microphone. Yeah, yeah. From the uh, plug. Um, yeah, uh, I think uh, it's what it's meaning is that like we like we ha where we have this uh, indexing of a list in Python, and you can go from reverse, so you can go minus one or minus two to access in the other direction, and and it should work in the Grasshopper Python uh, component. Uh, I think it's a mistake an error or something maybe yeah. you have forgotten the, this item access perhaps to get it as a list i don't know it's uh it's it's probably as a it works as a glitch because uh yeah but apart from that i'm completely agree with him it's uh yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it was more uh, the last question it was from his uh, him as well about data trees in c sharp and python uh, maybe you can elaborate more on that yeah it's just one second, so I will just read it quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, the data trees in general are very uh, grasshopper specific uh, collections or structures and data types. So for me, at least, uh, especially in Python and in C sharp, it's a little bit uh, easier because you have that kind of same uh, accessing and versioning, uh, like I mean, you have the attributes to access more similarly. But in Python, I always use this Python lib. Uh, there's some helpers there to convert from data trees to nested lists and nested lists to data trees. So also in C Sharp, when you're, especially if you're writing plugins, I never use uh, data trees uh, inside my script. I'm getting the data tree from Grasshopper, and the first thing I'm doing is converting it to kind of a native class inside a program mm -hmm. I'm working with. Mm -hmm. so it could be lists, could be arrays, could be dictionaries if you want, but Try to stick with kind of the language that you're working with at any time, and then you output it again in the correct format. I think that's the main rule, and there are some ways to, to overcome it, and sometimes you're lazy, but especially if you're new, it's easier to do it like that. Yeah, it can be a really good uh, good team for um, uh, Eric. Uh, okay, uh, that was one and a half hour exactly. Uh, so last uh, comments. Uh, C sharp in esc.com. We are starting new projects, so you can register uh, for a waiting list and get the best offer. The, the project will start this year. And I'm inviting you as well for the next uh, webinar in two weeks with Matthew Tam, where we're going to be talking about using Caramba for structure uh, engineers. Okay, that was all. Thank you for being with us. Uh, it was almost over. 500 people live on the peak on the LinkedIn and YouTube. So lots of people from all over the world. Uh, thank you for attending Ferdi on your presentation. And yeah, uh, we are planning to continue this kind of webinar. So this is not the first. We are planning, as I said already, a webinar uh, about C Sharp and Python and also comparing these two languages in uh, building industry. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sverre, for your time and Martin. And have a good time in Switzerland. And have a great weather in Bergen, Sverre. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is sunny today, so I will go outside for once. <laughs> uh, for those who don't know, the, in uh, Bergen, it's raining 320 days uh, in a year. Uh, so so this, this, he is lucky today and he can just go outside with the sun. So yeah. thank you, guys. There is lots of comments uh, and also comment from uh, Gediminas. Thank you, guys. Uh, it was a lovely session. And yeah, again, I'm thinking still to connect you as a Norwegian university with the Sweden university, guys. You should, you should work together and do something cool. Okay, thank you very much and thank see you next time. Yeah, bye-bye.